Hello, here I am. Awesome stuff. Uh, give me just like uh, two minutes. I'm just setting things up on my end. Alrighty, ladies and gentlemen, what's going on? Thanks for tuning in. I hope you're all doing amazing. Alrighty, Alexis, can you hear me okay? The, the origin. I can. Amazing. <laughs> Alright, so I'm just loading up the game here. Hello everyone in chat. Thanks for tuning in. Um, Alexis, thanks for uh, thanks for joining me today. I appreciate it. Yeah. Great pleasure. Let me just turn my game volume down here a little. <laughs> hey Zepper, what's up? Saxophone, what's going on dude? <laughs> Zero Iron, exactly. This is an amazing game. Alright, so uh, I guess to start, um, Alexis, why don't you uh, go ahead and introduce yourself, let us know a bit about uh, what it is you do over with Fail Better Games. Yeah, so I'm uh, Chief Narrative Officer at Fail Better, um, which means I write uh, the words, Paul does the pictures. Um, we have uh, other writers now as well, but we were the guys who uh, originally built Fallen London, the web game which spawned, and I do mean spawned, <laughs> some soon. Very cool. And so uh, tell me a bit, I, I guess taking this back, where... 
where did you guys come up first of all with the name for Fail Better Games? How, how did that come into come into being? Uh, I was having a literary moment. Uh, it's a Samuel Beckett quote: "Ever tried, ever failed. Try again. Uh, fail again. Fail better." Because cool. it's an iterative thing, you know, software developers keep on making things broken until they're right. Very cool. And um, so with uh, with Fail Better Games, like, how did you get involved? How, how did you decide to like start up a, a dev company? How how did you get involved with this? I think a lot of software developers want to be uh, want to do startups because you have this idea that, that you can make things. And I really <laughs> wanted to write. I really wanted to do design games. Every time I tried to write, I got the itch to design games. Every time I tried to design games, I felt I would be writing. So I thought. Fuck it, do both. Right. Uh, do something tech centric and, and gaming. And we spent three, four years kind of, of languishing in the wilderness because um, games which are all text uh, are a bit of a hard sell. And then we thought, hell, let's do an actual video game. It's still, as you've noticed, got a lot of text in it. Um, but it made the best use of um, Paul's uh, fantastic art. Um, and you've got a couple of very talented engineers too. And uh, the Kickstarter did really well, and it was kind of a breakthrough for us. So it's still kind of, of story first. Writing's always going to be a key part of it. But, you know, you couldn't stream for London. <laughs> right, exactly. Macabre, thank you so much for the follow. Um, so I, I guess, <laughs> uh, as far as, um, and you guys are having a crazy party there, right? Uh, I, I, we're British, so it's, it's a modest, modestly crazy party, <laughs> you know, I think, I think Prim and proper. a glass of gin of Amdika, yeah. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, so there was, uh, like, speaking of writing, I mean, this, if someone asks if this is a text-heavy game, obviously it's super story-based, uh, tons of, tons of amazing stories, uh, but what's, I, I heard it's a quarter of a million words total through this. Yes. Cruncher, it thanks for the quarter follow. Of a million words. It's going to be more by the time we're done. We're going to be sporting with three updates. Uh, we'll do some paid stuff as well. Uh, but I, you know, I would think we'll probably be three hundred thousand by the end of the year easily. Wow, amazing! And I, see, that was uh, speaking of DLC and stuff. That was something that um, I was really blown away with was the fact that um, for those that were involved with the early access. Uh, having access to DLC and all this other stuff. I mean, you don't see that from a lot of companies who who start up with early access. They're sort of like, well, thank you for your money. You know, thank you, thank you for your money. Here, here's the game. I, it really seems like you guys are willing to give back, and I think that's something that's really cool. It's, it's you know, our fans are our life. Uh, we, we we say our three priorities are safety, fun, and profit in that order. And, you know, we, we, money's nice, but we want to have a good time making games. And above all, we want to make sure that we keep on filling the niche we fill and making the kind of things uh, that our fans love. Because that's, that's you know, one, it's the right thing to do. But two, uh, it means that we, we've got um, a space we live in rather than having to, to worry too hard about how to compete Right. Uh, with a very, very large number of talented indie game devs out there. Right, exactly. And um, I, I, I guess uh, we have a question here from Obsidian. He's saying, are you planning any other games in the shared universe? So I know, I know we just got this one out. You guys, like, just launched this one. What's next? <laughs> Uh, I, I would love to tell you, but our, our PR person is in the room, um, and I don't uh -huh. think both of us would leave if I did. Uh, but yeah, we have plans, okay. um, and the, the first thing we are definitely doing, uh, I'm not going to say the first thing, but something we're definitely working on as soon as we've recovered, uh, is Submariner, which is the under the expansion, the under the under the expansion for uh -huh. Summer Sea. It's a thing that we committed to as a Kickstarter stretch goal, so we're going to go another surface. Amazing. But yeah, we definitely want to do future games in this universe. Um, very cool. And talk to me a bit about the uh, the art direction behind this. What, um, as you guys were going ahead and developing this game, was there a reason you chose? Um, it, was it all based off of uh, how Fallen London plays? Was it was it um, like was that sort of where you wanted to take it? Keep the art direction the same. So the idea we had was um, the, the, the 2D thing came before the art direction, really, because I, I like the idea of a game that was like a map, 
because maps are, are one of the most fun parts of gaming and of you know fancy books really that you have this invented space that you explore um, and I, I really like top-down games and also immediately then it made sense of what Paul could do because he is this extraordinarily talented painter um, and he could do 2D islands uh, that look um, godlike but if we had to learn how to build these things and, and as 3D assets, you know, one we'd had to, to skid up in a bunch of other ways, two would have taken us four times as long because the, the whole game, you know, is, is based around there being a lot of content because it's not procedurally generated because it's all handcrafted, although we shuffle them out. There needs to be loads in there. So we just spent most of the last two years writing and drawing. Right on. And now, um, I guess another thing that I wanted to know, a lot of these uh, sort of core portraits, um, so the, are, are they based off of anyone? Was there any inspiration from some of your Kickstarter backers? Was, was there anything that sort of tied in from that direction? Yeah, so the, the silhouettes are all, all, all super general. We just wanted things that um, worked really well in distinctive silhouettes, which is why you can see a lot of them have, have crazy hats. But um, Paul, I know, has had certain um, actors and actresses in mind for uh, some of the uh, characters, but there's about a dozen characters in the game who are all Kickstarter backers. We sent right. us their likenesses, or in a couple of cases, likenesses of their RPG characters and put them in the game. And my mother, to my terror, backed our Kickstarter at the like, 500 backer level and insisted that I put her granddaughter, my daughter, um, in the game. So the monkey foundling is, in fact, a portrait of <laughs> my five-year-old kid. <laughs> nice, that's amazing. And how do you find um, being involved with the, the game industry and... and um... Having, I, I don't know if it's your, your only child. I, I've got a, a son myself. He's eight months old. And uh, I am personally am super excited about being involved in the game industry, seeing the direction it's taking, and, and having a child sort of coming up in this, this age. Uh, what do you, what's your take on that? Uh, it's So, you know, first of all, uh, never start a business um, in the same month as you have your first child. That was about the stupidest thing I can imagine doing. Um, it's been very challenging sometimes. Yep. But the nice thing now is, is running your own business. It means that um, you can at least arrange your hours to manage childcare. But uh, kids growing up gaming, oh my God, she's five. She has a house in Minecraft. Uh, <laughs> it's made of what she calls fashion blocks, uh, which is kind of um, pinky purple clay. Uh, I think, and she, she goes around telling people that she went uh, fighting yeah. zombies with her daddy and had an adventure that we destroyed the zombie spawner. <laughs> so it's, it, you know, it's amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm 43. I, I grew up a nerd. I was used to computer games being a, a minority thing. And suddenly being a language that you can share with other people um, and with your kid is, is hugely exciting. It's great. Very cool. Um, Obsidian is asking any thoughts on uh, what's distinctive about the British game industry? That's a really dangerous question. Um, <laughs> it's okay, I'm Canadian. I mean, I, I came from, from you guys anyways, so that's fine. <laughs> yeah, no, but, I mean, it's, uh, I think two things that we do well are humour and horror. And I think, um, you know, obviously Fallen London is both of those, those things. There's a particular kind of self-deprecating humour uh, that you get in a lot of, of British uh, indie devs. And the particular kind of, of um, dark stuff that doesn't take itself too seriously, I, I think that's, that's a bit of a great thing. Okay. Um, now, I, I just, I, I had a chance to play this um, a few months ago and then having a chance to play yesterday, I think we went through like eight hours yesterday or something crazy, it was awesome. Um, one of the things that I've noticed is um, not necessarily, well maybe it was partially easier just because of the, the added tutorial and, and everything along those lines, but did you guys end up tweaking some of the game mechanics? Um, oh yeah. Based on based on feedback yeah. from the community, that sort of thing. Yeah. So this was this has been um, this this game is so much better for having had the community involved in the beginning. We had Kickstarter backers in the early beta. Um, then we had early access. We've been tuning it for almost a year now, and we, we really watched the community closely. Uh, we're very lucky. We've got an amazing community who are mostly smart and polite, which is, uh, you know, not something you always get in games. And, right. um, 
Uh, one of the things I learned from Fall in London is it's always better to start hard and loosen the screws because people love you. Because if you start easy and tighten the screws, people hate you. And right. we, you know, at the beginning, the game was too hard. We knew it was a bit too hard. It was just a matter of, of, of how to loosen it up. And now we have people on the forums complaining it's too easy. Not many. You know, <laughs> right. it's still a hard game. It's still something that's easy to lose at. But, but I, th I think we've got the balance a little about right. I'm not 100% happy with the experience when you when you die and you restart. I know the game's still too similar on restarts at the beginning, and that's one of the things I really want to fix with updates. But we'll get there. Right. Well, you know, I, I personally I like the the idea um, of of being able to, and I like the idea of being able to. Um, you know, carry on that legacy of a character. I think that's a cool idea. I like the way that you've incorporated it with, you know, you have to get a, a an a, an ironclad will. You have to kind of leave leave a legacy for future captains. Um, so it's it's interesting. It's not uh, it's not an all is lost uh, situation uh, like you get with with typical rogue like games. It's uh, it's it's an interesting dynamic. Mm. Yeah, no, I played a lot of FTL. Um, surprisingly yes. enough, while we were running up this game, and and, and fantastic game, but uh, a little more persistence, I wouldn't hate. Spelunky, again, the same thing. The whole point about Spelunky is is that you lose everything, and the only thing that persists is your knowledge of how to play the game. Uh, okay. But again, you kind of wish yeah. a little bit more stuff on the creature on the way through. Thanks. You too. Now, uh, speaking of speaking of other games, uh, what's your uh, uh, of course Sunless Sea and Fall in London? But what's your what's your favorite game outside of uh, outside of yours? Of, of all time, uh, top of the list, Deus Ex. I mean, up there as nice. well. Thief, uh, probably Thief Two, I think is is uh, the best of. Um, Civilization. I played more as a Civilization than than uh, I'm willing to admit in public. I think. Um, there's a really fine mod, um, Fall from Heaven 2, um, which I probably played more than the other Civ. Um, Derek Paxton, the guy who built that, got hired by Stardock to work on um, for a magic. So it tends to be RTSs or story driven, um, FPSs or CRPGs. Very cool. And uh, I guess the music, I mean, the music, the soundtrack for this game is just amazing. I love it. Um, talk to me a bit about the music direction, uh, who was involved, how you guys kind of worked with that. We were so lucky with that. Uh, years ago, when we first launched Fall in London, we had a Canadian film composer. Yes. Um, uh, who was a fan. He mailed us and said, if you ever need music for your, your game, you know, talk to me. And, we had no money, um, and you don't really have music on a, a browser game anyway, so we just kind of said, yeah, sure, you know, nice, uh, whatever. Um, and then when we uh, did so on Kickstarter, we, we went back and said, hey, Maribeth, um, how about it? And we kind of looked her up, and she was a little more famous than we realised. She does um, the music for uh, big IMAX documentaries. Um, the last two she did, I think, were... Um, uh, underwater and in space, which were massively appropriate. And she just did a treatment for us and, and blew us away. But we went back and said, can you make it like a little bit, you know, 20% um, less sense of wonder and 20% more um, terrifying. And, and she did it, you know, it really, really, really nailed it. That's amazing, yeah. And um, I guess, how does... Talk to me a bit. I, I know it's a huge process. It's it's based around an entire team of people. I get that. What's what's sort of the, the process as you're putting this together, uh, especially in your role? I mean, sort of overseeing all this when you're when you're looking at uh, combining the art, the music, um, the <laughs> the story that goes with it. Do you guys like end up having having to lock yourselves away into a room and yell at each other for a week? Like, how does this how does this all come together? Uh, well, we're Brits, so there's not much yelling. We're occasionally raising right. our eyebrow in a sarcastic way. But uh, the core <laughs> team was three 
Um, and then on, on top of that, um, we had a, a guy who built a lot of the uh, backend system stuff that connected to our, our story CMS. Um, and we got in three, four, four guest writers um, and the staff to do um, some of the items. But most of it was was banging a lot of words on a laptop. And um, the, the biggest collaboration thing was, was uh, Liam doing systems, Paul doing art, me doing words. And we just make sure we were talking to each other all the time. And one of the things that's been so great about the way the game came out is how collaborative it's been. A lot of the time, I'd give Paul a brief when I'm key come back and say, how about if it were more like this? I'd adapt the narrative brief to fit that. Or I'd say, oh my god, no, that's been settled in law for, for years. Um, I'd ask Liam to make the combat work in a particular way. He'd come back and say, actually, I've got this really cool idea. If we use the interface to do this, we can do that. So the whole thing has, has really emerged, although I'm nominally creative director, as a, a consensual thing over time. And just, just right. when you talk to each other, you, you have to challenge each other's ideas and you have to um, defend your ideas in an honest way. So it's very hard to, to hide if you're being creatively lazy. Very cool. Um, Mysterious Saxophone is, is asking uh, if there's any sort of plans or thoughts on, um, I know you guys are going to have some paid DLC, is there any uh, expansion um, with free DLC that you guys are considering? So uh, there's that Get New Stories button uh, in the bottom right hand corner of the page, uh, and that stuff will light up probably later um, next week actually. But certainly we've got two free expansions planned for this month. Oh, very and cool. We, you know, I, I, I'm expecting we'll put out some, some free content over time. How much depends on how many copies of the game you sell. So, you know, tell your friends. Uh, but I'm a big fan of the way, you know, Arkan, who did AI War, uh, managed free updates, uh, people like uh, Clay as well. Uh, and again, like I say, you know, our fans are our lifeblood. So if we can deliver value, that we know that people are going to buy our next games are going to develop the kind of relationship with us that we want to, to possibly keep going. So yeah, there'll be paid DLC, there'll be substantial free story downloads, exactly how much, I don't know yet. Right, okay. And um, Sector is asking uh, about Castles in the Roof. Um, is it too early to tell? or uh, is Too it, early is... to tell. Yeah, okay. I'd, I'd, I'd love to do it. Um, uh, yeah, I'd love to do it. I've got a lot of ideas. It, it really depends. Right, that's fair. Um, Wachika is asking, uh, have you uh, actually have you have you thought about actually doing something uh, with writing outside of gaming? I've thought about it. Um, I all my skills are, uh, are interactive fiction skills. You know, I'm used to writing in small chunks and beige boxes in ways that incorporate player choice. So sitting down and writing a novel would be a really different kind of thing for me. And there's so many things I want to do with games, and it's just really low on my list. Okay, very cool. <laughs> Obsidian Orangutan says, we love you two. And we love you guys. No, I mean, I'm serious. It's a, there's a really great thing about having a game that has loads of text, which is that it's a, basically a giant reading comprehension test. So it filters out total troll assholes. So we have almost no total troll assholes in our community. Um, and that's awesome. Right. Um, as far as the... Uh, um, Sorry, I'm in the middle of fighting bats. <laughs> as far as the uh, the fight mechanic goes, the, the the combat mechanics, I know that sort of changed up uh, partway through the game. What was um, what was sort of the driving force behind that? So when I first designed the combat system, uh, we were still at the stage of thinking, you know, are we really capable of doing an, an actual an actual game? We're used to doing this web stuff. Our, our Unity dev is primarily a web dev. This is all, all new tech. We built a prototype to make sure we could do it before we went out on the Kickstarter, but it's still all a bit new and scary. And a turn-based thing seemed the least, it seemed less challenging. And we were worried about full London fans who were used to a slow-paced web-based game. Hey, so Rand. Gaming. And we wanted the game to be slow-paced. We wanted it to feel naive. So for all those reasons, we were turn-based. And the feedback we got overwhelmingly over months was it just doesn't work. People dread bumping right. into a crab and switching to the turn-based screen. 
So you went back to the drawing board and we find found ways to, to rework it, to fix some of the things that may be easy to generate strategies, a, a quick way to, to hammer on through it. And um, I, I really spent days in front of the whiteboard knocking this stuff together. We built a digital prototype, uh, which I think is on our, our blooper reel, which we might, might share at some point. Um, and it was, you know, it was fine. It was, it was okay. It was an improvement, but it was not a giant improvement. And Paul, Paul's thing is, he has a habit of saying this might be a crazy idea, but, um, and you know, nine times out of ten, it is a crazy idea. And one time, it's a great idea. Uh, and he said, well, is there any reason you really can't um, do real time combat? And I said, oh, don't be so stupid, Paul. You know, we've already been through this a hundred times. Right. And then, you know we can't do it because... Uh, and he said, yeah, we just talked me through the reasons. We talked you through the reasons. 20 minutes later, he convinced me we should probably do it. And we went through everything really carefully. Two hours later, we were like, yeah, fuck, let's do it. And the thing is, that suddenly about we were building, like, two interfaces rather than three interfaces. And then now all the fuel, all the light and dark mechanics, all the movement mechanics, all the terrain stuff, all of that feeds into the combat system and becomes part of it. Because before it lived in this entirely different space. So we had a, a bit of pushback. Like 40% like of our players said, oh my God, you know, we're so glad you, you, you switched. It's, it's a big improvement. Like 50% of our players went, oh yeah, cool, whatever. And 10% were like, betrayal! And I'm back to a completely different game. This is outrageous. Right. And I think to our discredit, we didn't feed back enough to our Kickstarter backers that we were changing it because we kind of, um, a lot of the high profile Kickstarter backers were on the forums, we were talking to them all the time and we forgot to inform it. So some of them felt it came out of the blue, but um, yeah, it was a tough decision to make and it was tough sticking with it. And also it cost us two months dev time, wow. um, which for an indie studio, you know, you, you feel that um, in your bank balance. But it's made a much better game, um, and, and we wanted to do right, so, so we did. Very cool. Um, now, as far as uh, combat mechanics go, is there a set strategy uh, that you guys sort of suggest? I know there's a couple ways to do it. Of course, there's stealth, there's uh, maneuverability. Uh, do you have a, a preference when you're playing? Stealth. I mean, you know, I, I like stealth in games generally, but. Um, the AI is, is, is smart enough that you feel that you are um, having a dialogue with it, but it is not so smart that it will aggressively pursue you. So I think very often, uh, yeah, I wouldn't do what you do with a life bird. I don't like to get too close to those things because they will fuck you up uh, if, if you, you misjudge it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's kicking my butt right now. Fair enough. Um, as far as uh, the stories go as well, I mean, is there um, is there sort of like a standard path that is that you would consider like a main storyline versus like all the all the outside stuff? Is it sort of uh, I guess more open world, choose your own adventure? So Father's Bones is meant to be the the main uh, storyline. I see Obsidian Orangutan just saying he really enjoyed my vlogging, so thank you very much. And I wrote a, uh, quite a personal piece about where Father's Bones came from, although I didn't realise it until after I finished it. But I wanted something that actually felt like a, a plot line people could hang on to. And I also wanted plot lines on, uh, that just felt like something you were doing while you were exploring the rest of the world. Because, it, you know, you, you talk to people who play Skyrim, three out of four of them will say, oh, yeah, you know, I never finished the main storyline, I'm just looking over the next mountain. <laughs> right. I wanted the game to have, in a much lower budget way, that, that kind of feel. But, if you don't want to pursue the storyline we've given you, you can go off trying to amass a fortune or write the Zone of the Z or whatever and just see everything the Odyssey has to offer, um, cross it, fuck up life birds, and um, enjoy yourself. But yeah, Father's Bones is is, um, uh, is the biggie. That right. and the, uh, things like the first curator um, up in, in Benderbite, um, I suppose, you know, some of the scavenger hunt stuff we, we, we've got, which give you a, a hub to return to when you start. Uh, uncovering stuff, the principles of coral as well. Right, okay, very cool. Uh, I know uh, I know you sort of uh, covered this dismally oriented as asking about future plans for the FL universe. Um, I, I think uh, Alexis was, was pretty much saying that this is uh, it's sort of hush-hush for now, but there, there are plans. I, I guess you can say that there, much. There, there, there are totally plans. There are um, three different plans that we are trying to prioritize. Four. Okay, yeah, four different plans we're trying to prioritize. Fear, right. 
<laughs> Surprise and all this. No, uh, so, yeah, soon. We'll, we'll, we'll be announcing stuff soon. But I need to sleep for, I think, about six weeks first. <laughs> <laughs> right, I guess this is uh, after... After the uh, after tonight, it's uh, it's bedtime for six weeks, right? <laughs> oh yeah, very cool. Um, and I guess talk to me a bit about um, is there is there a set inspiration for these stories? Like where they're really in depth. Oh, sorry, I just love the try, writing. I just wanted to say I noticed in the chat people saying Cyril, Port Cyril, Port Cecil. I have this fucking tick. I always say Port Cyril, Port Cecil. My team mock me for it. When I said Port Cyril, I went Port Cecil. <laughs> Sorry, go on. <laughs> All right, fair enough. We we got that one. Um, no, I was just as far as the the stories go, because uh, some of them are very in depth. The writing is just awesome. Um, how like what's some of the inspiration for some of these stories? Is it just you know a few glasses of rum, you throw around some stories, and you go with it, or? <laughs> It's more gin than rum, but basically, gin, yeah. Yes. No, uh, uh, it's being a colossal nerd. It's being, um, uh, it, it, it's quality time alone with a laptop um, and a deadline. Um, but I read a lot of, um, yeah, okay, so I was going to say I read a lot of period stuff. The thing that's difficult about the Undersea I discovered is there isn't actually that much period stuff because the age of steam was not the age of exploration. So I read a lot of Aubrey Matthew in the Patrick O'Brien books, the Napoleonic War era stuff, but it's all sailing. And it's all on the fucking surface. So there's things like weather, there's storms, there's sunlight, all these, these descriptions, these details of ports. So I had to, to trawl through that stuff and filter it. But um, Patrick O'Brien, Poe, Jack Vance, always been a really big influence. Uh, so I've tried not to steal from Jack Vance, but just be inspired by it. But I, I keep going back to Vance because he was a, a sailor. Uh, he was in the Merchant Navy. He, he travelled all over the place. Um, so yeah, I read too much. <laughs> well, hey, there's no such thing as reading too much. That's perfect. Um, and as uh, as Space Marine says, colossal nerds represent. Uh, I think that's uh, <laughs> that's good to hear. Colossal nerds represent. Absolutely. Um, well, uh, guys, do we have any other uh, any other uh, questions in chat that you guys uh, want to ask uh, Alexis? Um, and uh, while they're sort of typing those out, Alexis, is there anything else that you kind of want to share um, or or touch on? Talk from the chat. I've only recently realised this the round one is this huge tall columns. Paul tried to explain to me really early on you can't draw stalagmites in section, but it doesn't look good 2D and it really because I'm an idiot. It took me seeing what a stalagmite looks like in the game and how goddamn hard it is to draw to realise that. And he's desperate not to do a top down game for the next one. He doesn't want to draw any more roofs. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, do I prefer heads or cats or ears? I don't understand what that means. Top of the heads, favourite islands. Um, Frost found an ear M, the ones I did. Um, uh, Nuncio, I think. Which Space Marine uh, helped provide the brief for, which M Short did an absolutely blinding fucking job on. Um, in terms of the look of the islands, I think it's got to be King Eater's Castle or Palmerston. Um, or Frostbound, which is just such, such a giant what the fuck thing. Uh, I did saxophone. They all died. Uh, I saw earlier someone was asking about uh, an islands named after or or from the Kickstarter. There's Visage. There's Nuncio. Uh, Visage was um, so. Jason Kapalka, who was one of the co-founders of Popcat, the guy who designed Bejeweled, um, back at the Kickstarter, um, and he was the guy who who put his stamp on uh, Visage. Um, so that that um, uh, that was back influence. We have a backer uh, influenced uh, couple of sea monsters in there as well. Uh, the rat barge, obviously. Um, the uh, eater of names, the the worm priest barge, um, and uh, the charmingly named Neptune's harlot, which is the giant snake that pretends to be a sexy lady. Uh, so all, all those were, were backer contributed. Right on. Very cool. Um, Wachika's asking what storyline you enjoyed creating the most. I'll give you a different answer every time I, I answer this, but I think uh, probably Frostbound, <laughs> because it was, uh, it's nice to set a pattern and then break a pattern. So things like Frostbound, um, which is... Um, Thank uh, you guys for the follows, by the way. ...effectively inside a giant um, ice mirror, or um, Irem, which is all written in the future tense. Uh, 
and my editor, uh, we, we can afford a part-time editor now, hated editing my work on IRM because the um, switching tensors uh, really fucked with her. Uh, but yeah, I think I think Fosfander and things I enjoyed most at the moment. Bike man, thanks for the follow, buddy. Very cool. Um, and uh, I guess um, as far as uh, as far as choosing Unity, was there was there a, a reason you guys? I, I know a lot of game companies are, are going with Unity. Is there um, what was that? Was the basis behind that decision? We looked at a couple of alternatives. Uh, at one point, we were looking at actually making this a, um, a browser game. And Unity, just uh, in terms of the mix of ease of use and flexibility, especially with all the plugins um, available and all the assets available, it was there, there wasn't really a choice. As soon as we started prototyping, we made the right decision. We're very happy with it. All right. Well, that's fair. Um, and uh, someone was asking uh, as well um, if there's any any sort of Easter eggs in the game now. Uh, Point point has been made that obviously the whole the whole game is about exploring and uncovering uh, new stories and that sort of thing. So they're all sort of their own Easter eggs. But I mean, is there any sort of external references that you guys would consider an Easter egg or, or hidden secrets? Yes. Excellent. I, I wasn't expecting an answer as to what they were. I was just. <laughs> yeah. No, there, there are um, a lot of it. Uh, uh... Uh, a lot of the time, it's not even deliberate. I'll have read something that went in so deep, I didn't realise I was quoting it until later. Um, but there, there are um, silly literary jokes tucked away in there. Um, there are, um, uh, I think, honestly, most of our players, especially the ones who, who poked with the source files, have found most of the things out there, but there's still a couple that are undiscovered, I know. Nice. Um, and I, I guess a, a question for me, I mean, I wasn't... Um, my first introduction to Fail Better Games and, and this whole universe is through Sunless Sea uh, a couple months ago. Um, what, it, where does the Z come from? Is this, uh, was there, was there an inside joke to begin with? Is it, like, what, wh how does that come up? I, um, I just wanted, back when you first putting the, the, um, the world together, I wanted something that sounded, uh, it's really fucking hard to think of a, a, something to call an underground lake that doesn't sound right. massively, massively, massively obscure, and I thought, you know, by doing that, it, um, gives a hint that you're not the first people to be here, just because it's obviously not English, but it's obviously a European language. I didn't even know. Um, it was um, apparently it is a, a, um, a valid Dutch word. I just thought it sounded vaguely West Germanic, and that that is for me. But that that gives you the sense it's already explored the space. It's been named by somebody else from a related culture rather than the same culture. So, and then the Z thing came out of that, and it became just this um, uh, ongoing gag. And then ultimately, it developed as a lot of our things do into a. A plot point um, that one of the first people to never get to see was a Dutch explorer who's got a backstory now, um, and a, um, uh, there's a whole tradition around Zaylas laughing at people who have used the word Z because it means that they want to be land lovers. Uh, oh, one Easter egg for you. You were just saying today, it's a few people have picked up on this than we realise. Demo Island. Um, up the northeast, uh, where the Iron and Misery Company have their funding station. The reason it's called Demo Island is it's the first island Paul drew when he tested the prototype, so it's the Demo yeah. Island. Aha! <laughs> Look at that. That's awesome. I'm really sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I love puns. That's great. <laughs> Very cool. Um, Wajik is asking uh, if there was any sort of inspiration behind the uh, Blind Bruiser's most glorious stash. And, and I guess a follow-up question. Yeah. Does yeah. any of your dev team have any epic mustaches like that? Oh, the mustache. Uh, no, uh, no. We have we have a bit of a beard theme. Um, for some time, I was the only person in the company who was male and had a beard. We finally hired a, a, a non-beard, so my my naked chin is not the source of shame to me that it used to be. But the uh, I think basically pirates have mustaches, don't they? That's probably why Paul drew the blind bruise the way he is. Okay. Uh, do you, uh, another question from Chad, do you intend to do comics again at some point? 
Uh, this is one of these things where I have to go, yeah, yeah maybe. But uh, right. Paul and Chris, who wrote this, Paul of the, the pictures, would Chris does skip the comment, um, would love to. They really enjoyed it. Uh, but it's very hard to find a commercial justification for it because it's a big chunk of both their time when they can be doing sea monsters. And uh, we'll write about that. Uh, so if we can find an interactive way to it, um, and we may be able to, then we'd like to do that, but we'll see. Cool. Uh, guys, do we have any other uh, questions in chat? I saw somebody ask earlier what my favourite bit of music was. Unmistakably, it's the comforting London theme, the, um, the one that plays when you first come to London, because really what Sun Sea is about thematically is that longing to go out to sea and the longing for home and the longing for a home that you might feel you never actually had. There's this word heroic in Welsh, there's another word saudade in Portuguese to kind of exemplify that, the nostalgia for a place you've never been. Right. And that's what we asked Maribeth to do for the music, and I really think she, she captured it as soon as you come into the game. You get this immediate, warm, wistful thing. So, yeah, I love that. Very cool. And um, I guess uh, <laughs> Funny Grant is asking, uh, how often did you guys read Lovecraft during your game's creation? Uh, not once. Uh, so I think you know, Lovecraft is not a direct influence. It's more an influence right. on lots of people that were an influence on us. But obviously, you know, I've read Lovecraft. It, it's gone into the pot with everything else. And oddly enough, um, Liam, uh, our Unity engineer, uh, Hi, bio didn't write any of the text, but did ultimately have quite a um, far-reaching influence on the look and the sense of the game. Is a huge Lovecraft fan. Um, I, I guess, uh, I'm curious about this as well, um, Obsidian is asking if you guys, uh, do any sort of events, conventions, um, and, and whereabouts are you guys based out of in London? We are in Greenwich, um, we're by the dome. Those of you who, um, uh, know London at all, Greenwich is, is kind of maritime heartland of London as well, the Naval College is down there. So that was an inspiration, and we actually did a, a couple of field trips to the um, Maritime Museum. Um, about your research in the game. Hi, Hannah. And um, I'm sorry, I'm eating cake. It's really rude. Uh, and events, we semi-regularly host the interactive fiction meetup that Emily Short of Legend uh, runs. Um, and M uh, didn't set up one at our end while we were uh, coming towards launch, but uh, look out for one of the next next um, two or three months. Uh, we hold it in offices, there's, there's usually two or three of us there. Very cool. Uh, do you have any uh, sort of advice or... Um, insight for anyone who's looking to get into the game game development um you know as as a career as an industry yeah. make shit so this is uh Stalfo a, says a Mega likes to murder and sailors and sail ships into the rocks kappa 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 kappa, 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 kappa magna is a shit dealer kind of so kinda hard, like yeah, it can be really hard to get noticed but if you make something, and there are a bunch of different tool sets you can use to, to, to do that, you will find out if you're any good at it, you'll find out if you enjoy it, and you've got a chance of getting noticed. So use Unity, use Twine, use RPG Maker, uh, use Tor, put something together. If you find you can't make stuff, if you find that you don't know how to code, you don't know how to write, you don't know how to draw, you run up against something, find somebody to collaborate with. But, but absolutely just to make stuff. Because the other thing is, you know, a lot, a lot of the time, I, I, I've lost count of the number of people who said to me, you know, they, they started doing game dev and they found, actually, it's not as much fun as they thought, even leaving aside making a, a living for it, but, but make sure. Right, I guess a lot of people sort of have it, an idea in their head of uh, a romanticized version um, that's sort of the finished product or, or creating your own thing, not taking into account uh, the business aspect or, you know, all the all the non-fun things that you have to do that kind of go with it to get a final product. Whoever it was who said, um, find a thing that you love doing and you never work in all day in your life, I want to find him and punch him in the ear because, <laughs> you know, it's just wrong. Uh, yes. It's still really fucking hard work, and I love my job. If I didn't love my job, I wouldn't be able to do it. But uh, even even you love my job, there are days where it's fun. 
right. Very, very good advice. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so what else do we have here from chat? Just scrolling up through chat here. Yeah, DLC, somebody asked about DLC. What we have committed to for definite is the Under the Hunter Z Submariner. Um, Submariner. Uh, expansion where you'll be able to go beneath the waves. Everybody who had the foresight to, um, and gentlemanliness or ladylikeness to buy in early access gets that for free. Right. Uh, and there will be free content updates as well, exactly how many we have now. Okay, very cool. Uh, someone's asking about the, the wretched, wretched Mog and why, why it doesn't speak. Is there, uh, is there a reason behind that? Uh, the wretched Mog is, a, Fallen Under players will know this, the wretched Mog is a starveling cat that got better. Uh, Bamboo County was frost found glass and chili a Lorca poem reference. No, it wasn't, as far as I know. I lived in Granada for a year. And I read a certain amount of local while I was out there, so it might have gone into my subconscious and come up. I don't know. <laughs> Fair enough. Pop Canadian, Pop Canadian is excellent. Chris uh, Gardner, um, our, our other staff writer, um, wrote that and did a really amazing job. Uh, Zelena Prime was asking, where did the hole in the roof above the Estival... I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, like I have half the words in this game. Uh, where, where did the hole in the roof come from? Estival is fine. Uh, it's the right pronunciation, I think. I'm probably say Estival, but, but then people laugh at me. Um, <laughs> uh, it's what I was saying earlier. You, you make a rule, then break a rule. So the whole Unterzy thing is that there's darkness, um, that you're underground, that you... Um, deal with rocks so it's quite all those those sort of things so we make a point of letting you go to the surface quite early on so it's like it feels different if you go east um, there's something that breaks the rule once you get up here to the map but i, I, I won't spoil people who haven't seen it yet east of all you know i, I wanted uh, given that people have never seen the sun the whole time they're underground actually showing the sun is a really good opportunity. And right. a lot of the ideas, a lot of the islands came out of, of me having been through the first um, uh, realization of, you know, oh shit, you can't make satellites, satellites look interested in 2D. Trying to find things for Paul to draw that would look good from the top down. So the Prison of Wisdom with the uh, giant toads covered in eyes that eat people in exchange for secrets came out of me going, okay, lily pads look good from above, what lives on? Lily pads, giant toads covered in eyeballs. Uh, King Eater's Castle, you know, uh, again, the, the whole um, substantial backstory that plugs into some of the deep spots of the game there. But originally, I just thought an amphitheatre looks like something uh, that would be really cool. And East Evil was the same thing. Um, I thought we could do a Sunday island, uh, and that would look amazing. And I just told Paul this, and he looked at my brief and he said, So, uh, clever guy, how are we going to do a shaft of sunlight? Top down. I said, oh, I, I don't know you're the part to that team. So you fixed it. Right, you right. It. <laughs> that, that's always good, though, being able to say, you know, you figure it out. That that always helps uh, helps utilize other people's experience. <laughs> um, I another thing. Um, I'm just going through uh, through chat here as well. Um. What's the relationship between the Masters and the Admiralty? Uh, I would describe it um, as one of studious um, ignorance. Um, the Admiralty, for plot reasons, as you've seen, is rather starved of resources. Uh, but the, the Masters have always ignored those parts of the machinery of London's government they can't buy. Um, and yeah, so, so the, the uh, common misconception, the masters don't run London, they just act like it. Uh, the parliament's still there, the Queen still has her constitutional role, although she's not well regarded these days. Um, uh, and the Admiralty is still the Admiralty, but the masters tend to get their, um, uh, their way and their desires felt one way or another. Very cool.
Um, well, guys, I want to uh, I want to take a minute to uh, give a, a huge thank you to uh, Alexis and of course Hannah. Hannah was super instrumental in setting this up, so thank you very much. And uh, Fail Better Games as well. Uh, thanks to uh, Fail Better Games, we actually have three uh, keys to give away for a copy of this game. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, set this up if you guys are uh, are interested in winning an extra copy. Um, Let me see here. How do I, how do we do this giveaway? Let me set this up. But yeah, thank, honestly, Alexis, like, thank you so much for your time. Uh, this has been an amazing uh, blast. I, I always really enjoy. It's a great pleasure. Yeah, I always really enjoy hearing from uh, the perspective of the people behind the game, uh, especially when you invest so much time playing a game. It's like, um, it's nice to kind of understand what the thought process was behind everything that you're seeing and uh sometimes it answers these questions you know we we make things up from our own perspective about what people must have been thinking or the thought process and it's, it's nice to get uh to hear from you guys on that so thank you and it's really nice to be able to to, to look back over development and it gives a, an ex when somebody asks you smart questions uh, it often gives you insight into what your own thought process was and it's been really good to see familiar names in the chat as well um so Thank you. I know a lot of you back the Kickstarter. Thank you very much for making it happen. Uh, we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for you. And thank you for supporting us. Thank you for enjoying our games. Uh, thank you for being consistently and memorably awesome for the last five years. That's awesome. Um, and uh, listen, if you guys ever want to do something like this in the in the future, I'd love to have you guys on. Um, again, to either talk about Sunless Sea or for any, uh, any other uh, future games that you guys are looking to do. Totally. All right. Let me uh, let me start this giveaway. We'll uh, we've got three keys from you guys, so I want to make sure you, these guys get access to them. Um, for anyone who's interested, uh, pretty much anyone who's in the channel should have uh, enough to uh, get at least one ticket. All you have to do is type exclamation ticket space the number of tickets you want. Uh, based off of points. Um, so we've got three copies of this game to give away. Once again, thanks to Fail Better Games. Uh, also, please, uh, maybe with Chica or somebody, can I get uh, a link put up for uh, for their uh, channel? I assume uh, you guys are going to be using your channel on Twitch uh, more in the future as well. Alexis? <laughs> no, I was just asking, are you guys playing on uh, using your uh, Twitch channel a lot more in the future? Oh, yes, definitely. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Twitch is a new thing for us because um, I'm a writer. You don't stream text. Um, right. But we have young people here, and young people understand Twitch. Very cool. All right. Well, uh, thanks again, and uh, thank you, Hannah. And uh, we'll uh, go go enjoy the rest of your party. And uh, say hello to everyone from us. I will. Thank you for your hospitality. Oh, you're very welcome. Take care. Good night. Okay, so guys, listen.